for you. Gore Vidal confessed to somebody once that his idea of heaven was to be on an endless talk show being asked questions throughout eternity. Well, Gore Vidal is, of course, one of our most esteemed and controversial novelists and perhaps our finest essayist. And his lacerating wit is nothing short of legendary. And when I was in Italy a while back, uh, I called him from Rome and he invited me to visit his villa on the beautiful Amalfi Coast. He said, you are welcome. Your cameras are welcome. Uh, I asked if I'd be welcome without my cameras, and he said, not as welcome. But anyway, here I think is a treat for you. Gore Vidal, at home, and in his usual rare form. Nice to see you, sir. Good to see you. Up. Be here on the cliff. We're at, I call this place the end of the road, because you can't go any farther. We're 400 meters above the sea. And here we are at the end of the road and the bottom of the heap. I was wondering, uh, aside from the fact of your tremendous popularity as a talk show guest, uh, are you on anybody's enemies list these days? We all remember years ago when a lot of us were. Well, I think probably always, you know. Yeah. Funny thing about being a writer is it's the one thing, I suppose movie stars are the same, but you're international. And if your reputation is sagging in your native land, if Americans, my fellow countrymen, are not buying Hollywood, my last novel. I get a wonderful report from Brazil. I'm a bestseller in Brazil. And always, and I'm a bestseller, the strangest places that I've never been to, and a bestseller in the Soviet Union. And the only common denominator I can see is each has a currency which is non-convertible. So I have in each place, I have cruzeiros or whatever they call it in Brazil, which can buy nothing, and I have rubles in Russia, which can buy nothing. Meanwhile, I'm unknown in Germany, where the mark is powerful. I could buy up half the country, would they but read. So enemies list, note the subtle way that I bring it right back to that question, which you had forgotten, but I remembered. That's why you're so admired. So yes. admired that no matter how he rambles, <laughs> it is always boring, and it always comes back to the point one. <laughs> I think I'm a permanent enemy of the corporate uh, ruling class of the United States, and... Voltaire, in his day, if I may compare myself to such a great man, I was a critic of his society, and he lived rather wisely, as you know, he was French, critical of the French system, friend of Frederick the Great, friend of Catherine the Great, critical of both, both their empires. He lived on the border between France and Switzerland, just in case. Any trouble came, he would just cross his kitchen and he would be out into, say, Switzerland from the French police. So I sort of live here part of the year, and I feel safe. I'm on the margin of the American empire now crumbling, but this place was absolutely on the fighting line during the, certainly during the 70s, when there were all kinds of problems here in Italy, mostly caused by our CIA defending Italy from uh, the Soviet hordes. So I sort of like being here on the edge of the old empire, and in the heart of the really old empire, which was the Roman Empire. So I would say, to answer your question briefly, is that, yes, I think I am permanently on the enemy's list of Mr. Bush, uh, any Kennedy, um, and I would suppose anybody that I had criticized, not in a personal way, but for what they have done to my native land, that what had once been a republic when I was young and growing up, in whose armies I served in the Second War, quite proudly has become an empire that is absolutely pointless one of greed, a national security state, at war with somebody somewhere all the time. So I am permanently on men enemies' list and very proud of it. Well, so, oh, have you ever um, run personally into anti-Americanism when you open your mouth to speak in your original language? Well, I, uh, one thing interesting about uh, with Western Europe, particularly now that Western Europe is far past the United States economically. And in education, I spend a lot of time in European countries delicately explaining that Americans are not stupid. They're, they're convinced that we don't know any languages, no history, no geography, no nothing, and uh, we can't sell goods anymore. And I said, no, uh, we're not stupid. Americans are as bright or brighter than anybody else, but we're ignorant from the Latin meaning not knowing. We're not, we're not taught anything in our schools. I mean, I'm not talking about just the ordinary people, because there hasn't been public education for about 40 years for anybody, but I'm talking about people like George Bush, who had an expensive education, similar to my own. 
But it, he knows no geography. He hasn't a clue what he's doing half the time. I suppose by now he knows it's the Persian Gulf and not the Gulf of Mexico. I think he thought it was that, you know. This Persian thing was an extension of Panama. It wasn't. The ignorance in high places and the ignorance among our countrymen is uh, very dangerous, and the Europeans comment on it. The Italians are very nice. They like Americans. Others do not like them, and they all the first thing they say, well, they're so dumb. And I have to say, mm -hmm. no, we're not dumb just because we can't speak your languages and we don't know who Dante and Michelangelo are. It doesn't mean we're not pretty good. We can learn it. So you can convince them that we're educable? Well, I try. It's always telling people the difference between the word stupid and the word ignorant. I mean, uh, if you hadn't taught Einstein mathematics, he would be pretty dumb about mathematics. But once he learned it, he was rather good at it. He may have been ignorant of geography. And he probably was. Lived in Germany. As a man who will confess both publicly and privately to the fact that he'd like to have been president, suppose you were now. I should think that anybody who wants to return to the principles of the old republic would absolutely get rid of the American empire. I would get rid of the CIA, which was not founded by George Washington, but is only 50 years old and is totally illegal, unconstitutional, and dangerous. We don't need that sort of thing in a free society. I would get rid of the national security state apparatus. We don't need that. We're not in the empire business. We're not any good at it. And I would take the money from all of that, and I would dedicate it to education and to rebuilding the cities, to what Henry Clay, one of our great leaders, whom nobody knows about because nobody's taught American history in the schools, but Henry Clay called internal improvements. And the first person to do that in the United States who can get that message across, he'd have to have all the magic of a Huey Long. But if he did that, he would sweep the country. And I think finally our people are getting the point that they have been had. Suppose, besides being president, you can control the educational system in the United States. What do you do to it? Well, you have to, who teaches the teachers? I mean, you have a, uh, you'd have an awful time starting up again. It'd take a generation. But if you put all your time, and not just money, but thought behind it, you'd have to start with languages. Uh, we're a small country that has to deal with uh, other countries. We have to learn Russian, Chinese, Japanese. We have to deal with the realities of the new world. I'd, I'd start right in there. I'd make history the background of uh, all education. Starting at the first grade, teach them Big Bang Theory, teach them Garden of Eden, teach them everything. Both superstitious, scientific, or religious, whatever word you want to use. Give them everything. Kids like to know about that sort of thing. Then I would just take it up gradually so that by the time you were 17, say, and graduating from high school, you'd come up to date. During those, uh, what is it, eight years of uh, junior school, uh, elementary school and high school, during those eight or nine years, whatever it is, uh, they would have been taught the history of the human race. And you can do it in a very interesting way. They don't know how our current teachers, because they don't find it interesting. But people do. And I think if you taught them uh, every legend about the founding of the human race, and then you just went in, and you went step by step. You got the Greeks, the Roman Empire, teach about Asia, teach about the Buddha. Yet the kids would be absolutely fascinated. History is nothing but gossip, finally, and great trends. So you have a double thing teachers can play with. One, the gossip, which is always interesting. And the other is the great trends, which are fun to play around with. So that by 17, somebody comes out and knows where he is in the world, where his country is, why he thinks the way he does. Then he might start to think. I suppose there have been people along the way who said to you, uh, I, at the beginning, I admire your deciding to write historical novels because uh, if a country is so uneducated and interested in history, nobody's going to buy them. Uh, does it argue against your own argument that you here are an example of the fact that uh, best-selling books can be written on the history of the United States? Well, I suppose the success of my historical novels, ones about American history, of which there are now six, uh, really is based on the fact that I am writing stuff that interests people enormously that they were never taught in school. I would much rather that they learn what I have to teach them in school so I can write something else. I mean, I'd like to be out frisking and playing, <laughs> gambling on the green with all the other lads and lassies and uh, not having to sit there with, in the libraries going to the stacks. So in a way, it made an effort to educate the American public but in a... In a um, painless way, a pleasant way? Well, it's painless. Way it's not ever, not ever done in school? Well, I thought it was, you see, I was brought up with an idea that you had a certain duty to your country and to your countrymen, 
And whatever were your talents, uh, you would dedicate a certain amount of time to that. Mm -hmm. The fact that these books were very successful was very nice, but they're also, I could have done some other things uh, that might have pleased me more. And uh, I'm happy I did it, but to get back to the point is this should all be done in the school. I'd rather that they learn in the school about Abraham Lincoln than have to come to me. And uh, that's sad. And it's sad when you talk to people who have really no sense of anything before they were born, and generally not much before they started looking at the evening news. And they only look, they don't listen to it very much. Can you imagine how the dialogue goes? Suppose your assignment for tomorrow is to write a monologue or a little sketch on how they meet each morning in the White House and talk about the day's problems. Uh, is it on a loftier plane than we suspect? No, I think the conversations of the White House are mostly about how to keep the Con Act going, how to keep the people from rebelling, because they know that if the people knew what they knew about the ownership of the country, they'd tear the White House down in order to try and get at these clowns. But the clowns in the White House aren't governing. I mean, they've been appointed. They're, they're employees of the Chase Manhattan Bank, of the international corporations, ITT, IBM. These are all... These are all acronyms of the ownership of the country. Can you illustrate that with an example like Ronald Reagan? Well, I would say Ronald Reagan was, uh, the ruling class had screwed up, and they have been ever since the Second World War. Things have not gone their way or America's way. And they first, they had with uh, Nixon, they had somebody who was a clever lawyer. They thought he'd be good at the job. He was bright, but he turned out to be much too crooked even for them, and worse, he got caught. Then they just tried, well, let's try a Jesus Christ or, you know, somebody schmarmy and nice. So they get Jimmy Carter, who's schmarmy and nice and can't put a foot right. That doesn't work. But he's part of the ruling class. He's not an outsider, as he pretended. Then they decide, oh, the hell with it. Let's just get a good actor, somebody who can impersonate plausibly a president, because now most presidents can't act the part. So let's get, and Reagan is always available for 17 years. He was giving that speech for General Electric, and he was telling them about godless communism forever on the march. And they just hired him, and he just went in, and he kept giving that speech again for eight years as president. The country goes bankrupt. He doesn't care. doesn't notice. Now they have uh, his heir, who is uh, a, a member of the upper class, who has never done anything in his life but just hang around saying yes. He's never lasted. I was looking at his resume recently, and he's never been more than about a year in any job. UN, CIA, China. It's always about one year. If you were writing this as a scene, who are these they who sit around and decide, do we want Reagan now or do we want um, Brian Hearn? Who do we want for president? Well, they don't do much meeting because they all think alike. Otherwise, they wouldn't have those jobs. They go to the same schools. You went to one of them, but you went wrong and went to television. But Yale is one of their is one of their schools. I went to one of their prep schools, Exeter, at the same time that George Bush was at Andover. Uh, you're just directed in a certain direction so that you can be president, you can be senator, you can be chief justice, you can be editor of the New York Times, Washington Post. They all think alike. Because they've all been trained, and outsiders who come in from Omaha, Nebraska, are quickly trained. Here's a chance to take back anything you've ever said that you kind of wish you had, either because you didn't mean it, you have a choice here, yes. or because so much um, grief came from it. No, I can't think of it. I try to be never ad hominem in the sense that I'm attacking somebody because of what he or she has done or said. If I attacked Lyndon Johnson or George Bush or something, it's nothing personal. It's what they represent, it's what they're doing. And what they do, I notice lately, you know, people always come, oh, you have such a vicious tongue. And I always say, well, what have I ever said that was vicious? Mm -hmm. Can you think of anything? Let's see. Um, now, funny, but we'll, but we'll just say, what is vicious? Vicious really means something that is out to damage vicious, somebody. Vicious, I suppose, means... It's malicious uh, with, with, with wicked intent to do somebody yeah. real harm. What's the last time you piloted a plane? Last time I piloted a plane was probably... Um, 1935, 36, mm -hmm. when age 10, I've got some footage of it now. I've got the Pathé newsreel of me flying a plane at the age of 10 with my father, who was director of air commerce. He was trying to promote a flivver plane. 
He thought that everybody, he was imitating Henry Ford, and everybody should have their own airplane. And he was trying to get one that would sell for $750, something like that. So he had about eight prototypes came to Washington. And there was one he liked very much called Hammond, Fliver Plane. And he said, why, it's so simple to fly, even a child can fly it. So he drags me out of school one day without telling the family, needless to say, and gets me down in front of a Pathé News uh, camera. And I take the plane off, and I land it very badly. Now I'm terrified. And I'm terrified not of flying or of the plane, because I'd done so much with my father. That part was quite easy. I wanted to be a movie star. And I already had my model, and it was Mickey Rooney. Ah. And I had seen Mickey Rooney the previous year at playing the part of Puck in Midsummer Night's Dream. And I just saw it the other night, and it's just as wonderful as I remembered it from 50 years ago. I wanted to be Mickey Rooney. And here was my big take. My father only got me to fly this plane because he said there will be newsreel cameras. Here is your chance to be a movie star. You too would be on celluloid. Well, not only on celluloid. And I was uh, quite different from what I later became. I had golden curls and a little snub nose. I think I was, I'm a changeling. I think <laughs> when I was about 12, I was switched <laughs> for something else. <laughs> something more Italian looking, but I look very sort of Irish, very Mickey Rooney-ish, in fact. And there I am, and I land the plane, not very well, but I, at least it doesn't crash. I get out of the thing, and I come over, my father greets me, and Floyd Gibbons, who was a great reporter those days with a patch over one eye from the First World War, well, boy, how was it up there in that plane? I said, well, it's just very, and I froze right on camera. Oh. And you can see that the end of the Pathé newsreel, I have suddenly gone into my Mickey Rooney grin, which I thought was extremely enchanting. <laughs> but I looked like Peter Laurie in M, just before he attacks a small girl. Not so much a grin as a rictus, was it? Or <laughs> a rictus, yes. <laughs> anyway, that was the end of my flying, and I fear the end of my movie stardom. Are, are you... Uh... In any sense, attracted by that sort of thing, a dangerous... Uh, I don't know if you're having any dangerous tendencies toward uh, skydiving or piloting since... Oh, I have probably the most dangerous of all. Writing. Yeah. That's... Uh, That's I, your... I, I'm on the edge, uh, the edge of the knife with that every time. It's your you brink, your to, tight wire. It's a tight wire. Yeah. And when you're on, when you're trying to explain something that people have been misled about, like how the country is run, and who is telling them lies, and where the money has gone to that has put us into such deficit. Uh, you uh, attract not only the anger of the rulers, but remember they control every newspaper, every television station. They control all the media, and they have the means of either trivializing you, making you seem like a silly billy, or they have the power of making you seem a devil. Mm -hmm. And in my case, or they have the power of silencing you. I've experienced all three, sometimes simultaneously. I've been trivialized, demonized, and uh, silenced. Over the years, they do work out a persona for you which suits them, so that no one will really take what you say seriously. I had a strange experience about 10 years ago with, um, oh, what's the little kid's name who worked for Lyndon John? Bill Moyers. Bill Moyers. The <laughs> little kid. Well, he's a little kid to me. and. Uh, he had watched me on, I don't know, Susquehanna or something doing one of my States of the Union, and he called me to say what a brilliant, he thought, uh, analysis I had done. And could he interview me for whatever he was working for then, whatever network? And I said, sure, I don't care. And then he, I got a, I a call from him much later, and he said, I'm sorry, we can't do it. But he said, what you say is so marvelous and so succinct, so exactly right, but, you know, we can't do it because you're you. I said, what do you mean you can't do it because I am me? Uh, he said, well, uh, yes, you know, and he sort of stammered around. And I assume he meant, because I don't hold office, I am not a head of a think tank, paid for by mm -hmm. heaven knows who, and I'm not a professor. Uh, I am a writer, which is already a dangerous, dicey category, and I'm known to be controversial. And I, I was always very struck by that. Well, you... Everything you say is right, but it, it isn't right because it's you. Well, maybe to get one of the people who is in one of those categories to say these things for you, then would it help? Well, you, if I paid Kissinger enough, he would. He certainly uh, can be bought to, to, for his firm to say anything. Uh, yes, I suppose you could. 
you could wind up a politician, I guess, to say them, but he, if he said them too often, said things that mm. they don't want the people to know about, then uh, he would be in great trouble. He would not be reelected. Was there a time when you ever you suspected that someone had to say, I'm Chief Gore, I'd love to have you, but oh, you know yeah. how they are upstairs. Well, sure. I had that with uh, Peter Jennings at ABC. Uh, Peter was around uh, just sort of starting out in 1968 when William Buckley and I were the stars of ABC. And we, we the two of us, our debates, at least made ABC number one in, for the first time in the ratings war over NBC and CBS. And Jennings was, I barely remember, he was a kid hanging around. And then years later, I'd see him around occasionally, and he said... Uh, it was the election that Carter was running, I think, the first time. Uh, and then a second one, and each time he said, well, let's get Gore on. And each time, no. Mm -hmm. And then he said, well, why? In fact, the last election, he asked again. I ran and I said, well, what did they say this time? Oh, they said he'll just be outrageous. And I said, you ask him what they meant by it? He said, no. So since the Buckley debates, in which I believe I did fairly well, uh, I said something in the first debate which was not acceptable to the ownership of the country, which own, owns the media. I said that there is no difference between the two parties. Now this is something you see already, I can tell you. you your eyes have glazed over, you <laughs> cut, cut, cut. <laughs> you can't say that. And um, ever since then, Buckley was asked on, I believe, to comment on every election, on every network show from then on, and I was never asked by anybody except Jennings, who was told twice he couldn't do it. To, to comment as an official. To comment, yeah. Because, and you get the official liberal, which will be poor Arthur Schlesinger or poor Ken Galbraith, and they honk away, and then you get Buckley or somebody like that on the other side honking away. Mm -hmm. No information of any kind is uh, afforded to the viewer. Yeah. I say this with perfect serenity because I expected uh, this kind of resistance. I mean, you don't uh, invite somebody in who points out that you're a bankrupt in the front of your banker. I hope this isn't betraying the office of a, an overnight guest, uh, but uh, you mentioned the Kennedys earlier as people whose enemies list you might be on, uh, and yet here in the house is a nicely inscribed photograph uh, from Mrs. Onassis, Mrs. Kennedy Onassis. There's um, a picture of Jack Kennedy, uh, just wandering the halls and the corridors I've seen these. Uh, Actually, he was going through drawers. I caught him in my <laughs> well, desk. He finally pried open uh, the uh, filing cabinet and got into that. I, I was looking for some bank statements. To the keep old my, bank statements. Yeah, I, I was looking for <laughs> collar stays when you caught me. I, I'm wondering if you find the public so gullible, Mr. Vidal, that you're expecting those people to believe that if you were, say, a guest of Miss Lauren Bacall, went to her room to get something and found her diary lying by the bedside table, you would. Do the manly thing and not read it. Oh, I'd rather die really? than yeah, look at it. An interesting trait. I wonder how if, many of us can say that. And if I have ever been in a position where picking up a phone, let's say, in somebody's house and the people are talking, and if they're talking about me, which most people would be very interested to see what other, hear what mm -hmm. other people have to say, but I can't, I can't listen. I even have trouble reading stuff about myself or watching myself on television. I don't certainly read about other people and friends, but... Uh, I don't know what it is, but uh, I don't want to be involved. I don't want to know. And, uh, my curiosity doesn't work along those lines. I think maybe you may have just hit on a definition of hell. Hell might be knowing what your friends say, have said about you every time you've left a room. Well, everybody, oh. who's, ever, <laughs> everybody who's ever listened was not very happy at what he heard. So. Yes, how many of us would have the guts to leave a small tape recorder taped underneath the table, leave, and come back and listen to that tape with I, what we consider our very... Best friends. I must say, the most savage dinner party I ever attended in my life was in London, where they, the best talkers in the world have always been. A lady called Annie Fleming, who was the wife of Ian Fleming, who was still alive, and she was a power society hostess, mostly politicians. She had a dinner party, and I was a young writer then, almost 30 years ago. Hugh Gateskill, the head of the Labour Party, who was her boyfriend. Ian Fleming never came to these things. There was uh, Nancy Mitford, his sister, the Duchess of Devonshire. There was Lucian Freud, Evelyn Waugh, um, Osbert Lancaster. 
Eddie Sackville West. It's you know, about 12 of the sharpest, most savage tongues in all of England, which means all the world. The conversation, I will not share it with your viewers, as it's just, it was just too sulfurous, but it was fascinating. Nobody left, and we sat around after dinner, <laughs> and even Evelyn Waugh, getting drunker and drunker, kept saying, you know, Tom Dryberg, who was an MP, was there, a member of Parliament, head of the Labour Party, he's not as nice as he looks, because Tom was absolutely hideous looking. And he would keep shouting this, and he had a great hearing aid, a sort of uh, mandolin, which he would swing around. And, and now, Mr. Cavett, how long are you in England? And he'd put this thing, and you'd start to answer, and then he'd pull it away, and you'd find yourself talking at the top of the table. This was Evelyn <laughs> Waugh's sense of fun. Anyway, at 3 o'clock in the morning, we were all worn out. No one had dared leave that living room. And suddenly at 3, uh, we were like lemmings. Something we were genetically trained to save ourselves or kill ourselves. We all rushed out into Victoria Square and <laughs> left our host. No a, one behind. In a block. In a block. 30 <laughs> people went, or 20 people went right out that door. If any two people had gone back for their hat, you'd have had all had Had anyone remained, luckily, Ian mm -hmm. Fleming had come in and gone upstairs. So he, she mm -hmm. couldn't have talked to him about us. Though she might have, but at least none of us would have been involved. Is there anyone whose who's wicked tongue you, even you, have been afraid of or... Uh, the contest winning way of putting it would be who's been the most spiteful speaking person you ever ran across? Well, wit is one thing, spite is another. Yeah. Something that the Truman Capotes of the world could never figure out. He thought if you said something terribly insulting about somebody else, or you gave revelations about their sex lives, which he had just invented on the spur of the moment, you know, he's a necrophile. Everybody knows that. He goes to Campbell's funeral parlor. He would start a whole rap like that uh, mm. about somebody who was perfectly innocent of the charges. Something minor he, like necrophilia or something. Yes, it was necrophilia. Uh, I, he would have thought that very witty. Mm -hmm. the, the true wit plays with the words as, as they're coming out, and one person, it's like, a bit like bridge. You, you play a card, another card gets played, 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 played. And you can get it going or even more like music. And that's wit. And it, it means you have to have great control over language. You have to have every shade of meaning. Interesting, living in Italy, they complain that I don't speak Italian very well, but I never bother to speak it very well because there's no word in Italian for wit. What? As the word doesn't exist. Oh. Uh, a, a witty line is lost here or difficult to translate. They have jokes and they can be funny. Does any language have a precise parallel to the word wit? I'm told the German does. You, you speak German, I don't. The French don't. Italians well, don't. German has the word witz, but that really means joke, and as we know, that isn't necessarily wit, as in two drunks mm. walked into a bar and so on. Um, uh, irony, which is a word in English which has a very light and rather attractive connotation of somebody who's uh, uh, rather modest and turning the joke upon himself or on the situation. Irony in Italian is a heavy word. Somebody mm -hmm. nasty, sarcastic is how it comes across, which is a bad thing to be. No, uh, wit itself, as distinct from just humor, uh, is hard to... Well, American speech has gone completely to pieces uh, during the years of the empire because you couldn't ever say what you meant. You couldn't say you killed anybody. You would say you interdicted them. Mm -hmm. And it all came out of the Pentagon, out of the White House. And now people are terrified of saying anything. I'm often called arrogant, and I often wondered why, since I'm a true populist, see everybody and treat everybody in the same fashion, which I don't think is uh, arrogant. And I figured it out as the way I speak. I never say, well, I think uh, maybe, well, I, I think, Dick, this is where I'm coming from. Uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, it's, it's Wednesday. Mm -hmm. No American now can say anything, well, I think that's wrong. If you say that, you are so arrogant and so vicious and so, what an awful person to say that he thinks it's wrong to jump off a cliff or something or push somebody over. What's the story with you and the New York Times? Oh, thereby hangs a tale of terror, a tale of horror. Not since Othello has there been anything so tragic, <laughs> so long, so, so boring. Do you think you can make it palatable and, and not shocking and disillusioning the younger viewers uh, that, that you and a major newspaper have had a... Uh, Contretemps or a what? It, what you well, they took against me in 1948 because I published a book called *The City and the Pillar*, which showed that homosexual relations between two all-American boys are perfectly all right. This was not acceptable in the New York Times, and they refused to take advertising for the book. 
It's a simple... And they, ref they refused to review any book of mine. They said as much, the, the book reviewer. So my next six books went without being reviewed in the Daily New York Times. They took no advertising. The Kinsey Report came out about a month later saying exactly what I'd been saying, and except they did it scientifically, Dr. Kinsey, and uh, the same war against Kinsey. They wouldn't take no advertising for that. Then over politics, over everything, and I've just, they have a sort of, they have an enemies list, and I have always been sort of the head of it. Attempts have been made to be friendly on their part, not on mine, and I have spurned most of them. Their favorite one is they're always trying to do, they've stopped now, but for years, to try to do one of the profile of me for the color magazine section. And I always said, sure, I'll do it. But I want to see uh, what words uh, are in quotes, what I have said, my conversation. Mm -hmm. I just want to check that. I don't care what you write about me, but just my own quotes, I must check. Oh, no, we never allow that, they said. Well, they've allowed Kissinger that right, Alexander Haig that right, anybody who asks for it. When they say they will not allow you to check your own quotes, it means that they're going to give you the knife and they're going to rewrite your dialogue for you, which often happens with our free press. No, the Times is a, it's an establishment newspaper and it represents... Uh, there is really, a, when it comes to anyone who cares about the country and its institutions, the New York Times is always there to shoot them down in the interest of... Uh, the national security state, they've all along been very much in favor of the Pentagon, the CIA, and so forth, the American empire, in short, and they're, they're, they're a part of it. And uh, critics of it uh, are not liked by them. And you have no friends there? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> it would mean that I'd failed somehow. You used a phrase in an evening uh, on Broadway, uh, actually it was technically on Broadway, it was the uh, a writer's event, but they used mm -hmm. a Broadway theater for it, and you and Norman Mailer appeared there. And you used a phrase that um, some found offensive, I suppose. Uh, you said that we in America are already the yellow man's burden. I took an awful lot of flack for what I said that night at the Royal Theater on Broadway when Norman Mailer and I made it up in public. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was really giving sort of a review of our situation in the United States. And I said that we had the previous year been passed by Japan economically, and we were the number one debtor nation. They were the number one creditor nation. I said, also, we must remember that the white race, at the beginning of the next century, is only going to be about 16 to 18 percent of the population of the world. And let us hope that the Oriental peoples, uh, who are far more numerous than we are, and the other races on the globe will not treat us as badly as we treated them. What to do? I said, it is, and this is where I really got into trouble. I said, it is inevitable that the Soviet Union and the United States will make an alliance. We both were neighbors in the Northern Hemisphere. I think I referred to us as the two klutzes of the Northern Hemisphere. Neither one of us can make a car that anybody wants to drive, and it is inevitable that we will not only unite ourselves, but we will be, you can't use the word race without being called a racist, so I shall be called a racist, will be a sort of last redoubt of the white race against the Oriental peoples who have really taken over the world economically. Well, the laughter that went up over that, the United States and the Soviet Union, well, that came to pass, what was said there, and it was very interesting that absolutely nobody present we had every journalist in the world wanting to see a fight between me and Norman Mailer on stage. No one in there reported what I have just said, which was very yes. interesting and which was prophecy, and it came true. Maybe it's what Bill Moyer said. Well, it's, it can't be serious because he said it. They were there for the, looking for other things. It's almost a case of um, you know, the, the classic old joke. Uh, there was no, the president was shot and there was no speech, so the reporter reported nothing. Yeah, uh, nothing happened. Uh, mangling the punchline of a famous joke. Um, but I, in, in recent times, any number of people have claimed to have foreseen the collapse of communism, Brzezinski and, and, oh, and yeah. others. And after two or three of those, my mind went back to that night when I thought, how's he going, Vidal, going to finish this sentence? The two collapsing powers in this country better embrace each other. Uh, and I said it was because, inevitable uh, an alliance between mm -hmm. the two. 
And uh, I didn't even say uh, as a possibility. I said it was inevitable mm -hmm. and uh, indicated it would be quite soon. There it is, but uh, I'm often quoted, but never with attribution. It's always somebody else said it. <laughs> and I don't mind being a quarry for others. I'm out to, as W.C. Fields would say, we're here to not only to entertain, but to illuminate. So <laughs> I don't mind illuminating a little bit and letting others take the credit. Well, surely you weren't the only one in the world who saw this coming. And if it, no, but, but I was certainly... How did you happen to if so many didn't in positions uh, who should have? Because I live part of the year right here in Italy. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of time to think, which most of the people I know in my situation never do. Many of them never have and don't like thinking. Well, I sit here with a lot of books. I don't read the American press very much. I read the Wall Street Journal and the International Herald Tribune. I can't stand the American press because it is so biased and so dumb and it tells lies about other countries constantly. It doesn't even know that they're lies. So I follow the Italian press, the French press, the English press, and I get a much clearer worldview and anybody could if they did what I do and were interested in doing it. I was able to figure out the inevitability and also the coming race wars which are going to be horrific. I mean, we've lived with the black and white one in the United States now for over 100 years, which gets no better, thanks to the American empire, having taken all the money away, which might have gone to helping out those uh, who are not so fortunate. And I saw this as, as the future. I also traveled quite a lot in Asia. And to go and see these thriving countries, I mean, to go from Hong Kong to Los Angeles is like going from the 21st century to the 19th century. L.A. airport looks like something. Stagecoaches should be coming in and out of it. Or Hong Kong or Singapore. It's, uh, and, and have you ever heard an American tourist go over there and come back and say, gee, you know, it's surprisingly modern. Oh, I, well, you see, they live in the bubble. They don't know about other countries. Mm -hmm. I've been reading the American press for, let's say, half a century, except when I'm over here. And uh, I have never, in a half century, read a story in the American press that was favorable to another country. They'll say, yes, the Amalfi Coast is very beautiful, and there's wonderful fish here, and there's wonderful holiday skiing there. But you get to talk about the society. Yes, in Sweden, they have a better educational system in the United States, and uh, they live longer, and they have wonderful daycare centers for children, for working mothers, but they're all alcoholics and they have the highest suicide rate in the world, which is a lie. They have a, the United States has a higher suicide rate than Sweden. Everybody in the United States has been conditioned to believe the United States is number one, when it's about number 17, uh, in the world, that everybody wants to live there, and that every country is backward, and every country in Western Europe is ahead of the U.S. in quality of life. And they can only compare it to them. They see these poor people coming over the, the, the river, over the Rio Grande. And they think, you see, they want to come here. The boat people want to come here. Yes, but I haven't seen anybody from Stockholm lately trying to move into the Riverside Drive. Gore, who do you turn to uh, as a writer when you, when you want to laugh? Whom do I want to turn to is what you mean to say. Well, I didn't want, I wanted to bear you out in your comments about American education, and so I said, who do you turn to? Well, whom do I turn to? Or as in the song, who do you, whom do I turn to when nobody needs me? That's right. Or as Joan Crawford once said in an, in, in an interview, and whom is fooling whom, she said. <laughs> Great lady that she was. Got 50% on that. I don't hmm. turn to nobody. No? No. You can't, you, uh, student asks you, uh, Mr. Vidal, what successful comic novels have there been in your time? P.G. Woodhouse, okay. I would say was the greatest comic novelist in my time, or any time, really. Most fun. There are certain people that you read that you get immediately a kind of shock, a recognition. You get a charge of energy from them. Not many. But it's very nice when you see it in somebody new that you don't know about has come along and suddenly... It's very easy to be a critic if you're interested in the subject. Most of the people who become critics or reviewers are not interested, and so they, they can't tell whether anything is good or not because they're not plugged into it. If you really care about literature or ideas, let us say, then it's like a current of electricity when, 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 you, when you meet a text that's really good. Yeah. And it's the same thing with the, the novels. Say, I don't read many novels, but I've been reading a few lately, and I, there's a... 
girl in England, I call her a girl, I suppose she's in her late 20s, Jeanette Winterson, Sexing the Cherry is her latest book, and uh, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, which was made into a, I'm told, a very good BBC uh, miniseries. Mm -hmm. She's just brilliant. She's wildly funny, uh, very lyric as well, very sexy. Uh, reading her, I thought, oh my heavens, this is, this is, this is, this is writing, this is, this is somebody. And most writing is just blah. You just sit there and you know that the people who did it don't care, the people who published it don't care, the people, you know, and you, you don't care as you face the text. This Mention does not her. answer whom I turn to, no. but it answers what I turn from. Mention her name again for people who wish they had written it down. Jeanette Winterson, W-I-N-T-E-R-S-O-N, and she has got about four or five books. She's published all before the age of 30. And they're short, and they're wildly funny, and they're, they're very strange. Are you saying that you can't recall a time when you've thrown your head back and laughed out loud reading uh, anything since, what, Mark Twain, Benchley? Uh, any? Oh, I suppose I would, that's, a, that's a big question, Dick. I'm sorry. Uh, Try to keep them small. I'd rather, yes, I'd rather have small questions. About, okay. uh, I mean, anything Richard Nixon said used to break me up, you know, no matter, particularly when he was really serious. Mm -hmm. Hilariously funny. Bush is pretty funny. He makes me laugh. Yeah. But, um, no, there, there are no writers. There's somebody called now that I quite like, um, David Barry, who appears in the Herald Tribune. He's a columnist, and they collect his little pieces mm -hmm. and books, and they sell them. And I've, just, I've only read about ten of them uh, in the Tribune over here, and they're wildly funny. Same he was writing recently about how the public has turned against politicians, incumbents and outcumbents as well. And he said, why, a two-term governor of Oklahoma was defeated by an unaffiliated jar of mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say, I, had, now, I, I fell to the floor on that one, so I did think. Now, he'd have to say mayonnaise for people like me from Nebraska, but I would right, probably, yes, probably, right. probably tell him that so he wouldn't uh, <laughs> embarrass himself in Nebraska. But are there actors you could enjoy hanging out with in, in your days in Hollywood? Oh, yeah. His company? In fact, actors are very often the best company in the world. They have the best stories, they know how to tell them. Mm -hmm. And if an actor is slightly literary, you can, you really get, sometimes can be very interesting. Alec Guinness, for instance, is a wonderfully witty man in a very sly and murderous way. Dirk Bogart, curious enough, they're mostly English, as they were better educated. Dirk Bogart is very civilized, again, very good company. Our team, Jose Ferrer, is a great company wonderfully funny about his life and times. David Niven, everybody knows from television, he was just as funny as you know in real life. Clark Gable was the boyfriend of my mother's. Yeah. And uh, his main, uh, for about 20 years, they'd see each other off and on. He liked older society ladies. And he would be around occasionally, and I remember him as a kid, and um, he had a party trick. He was a heavy drinker. And the, one of his party tricks, after a certain amount of alcohol, he had all false teeth, and he had some kind of weird peg, and he would loosen the peg, and then he'd shake his head, and they would all go like dice. It was the most <laughs> awful thing you've ever seen, to see Clark Gable, the most famous, beautiful male face of our time, Rhett Butler, Rhett with a mouth, mouth full of dice. And Red I, Butler could jiggle his dentures. His dentures. Individual teeth went knocking against oh. each other. It was a weird effect. <laughs> Made a great impression on me when I was 15 or 16. <laughs> so that generation I, I didn't know so well. It was the next one that was mine, the Paul yeah. Newman, your friend Brando, and so on. I knew them better. Uh, I like the company of actors. And I even, I, I, like, I, I like finding out about productions. I mean, Cedric Hardwick would... I used to have lunch with him when I was at MGM as a, the last contract writer, and once a week we'd have lunch together at Romanoff's. And I'd quiz him about Beer Bomb Tree, about the London and French theater, Sarah Bernhardt he'd seen. And wonderful stories. He said the greatest moment that he'd ever seen in the theater was, I told this story to Greta Garbo. Now you really want some great name dropping. And I'll give you Greta Garbo's response to the story that I'm about to tell, which Cedric Hardwick told me about when he was a young man, the greatest moment that he ever saw in the theater was Sarah Bernhardt in her 60s with a wooden leg 
was playing Joan of Arc. Curtain goes up. Sarah Bernhardt is sitting downstage, center, on a stool with her back to the audience. The audience is back there. In front of her, there's a tribunal with three judges. First judge, what is your name? My name is Joan. Second judge, where are you from? I am from Dom Remy. Third judge, how old are you? I am 18. And she turned and faced the audience. <laughs> and Hardwick said the whole place fell apart. I mean, they were cheering and so on. And I told the story to Greta Garbo, just as I told you. Uh -huh. And Garbo gave a long pause and said, oh, how stupid she must have been. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, do you suppose they did laugh when she turned toward them? They the applauded. They went, mm -hmm. they, they went they mad. Liked, and then that was the reaction she wanted. Really. Yeah, and I was explaining yeah. to Garbo how the thing, because I was trying to talk Garbo into uh, <laughs> uh, going on the French stage and doing a classic role like Fedge. Because Garbo and I used to take these walks outside Closters in the sealed Retta Mountains. And she liked to recite poetry, and suddenly she started off in this great comedy française, Boy, je suis la fille de Minos et de Pacifier. And suddenly this great bronze voice was coming out of Garbo in very good French, better French than her English. I said, my God, why don't you go in Paris and do that? She said, oh, I'm too old. She always would say that was her answer to everything. Too lazy was the problem. And uh, then I told her the Bernhardt story. And mm -hmm. she said, how stupid. <laughs> if you're old, you don't do these sort of things. Can you understand her leaving? Do you, do you find, even though you knew her, all that a mystery? That she no. Did? It was a series of accidents, like most things in most people's lives. That the war came, and she was never very popular in America, but she was an enormous success in Europe. With the war, Greta Garbo lost her European audience, and MGM would then be stuck with a star who they paid a lot of money to, who wouldn't make money for them. She was a perfect gentleman, as she would have said. She was referred to herself in the masculine. And as a gentleman, she said, you can let me go. And she took only a fraction of what they would have owed her. So she left, no hard feelings. She'd been upset by the failure of two-faced woman, but it wasn't just that. It was the war and losing the European audience. Two-Faced Woman was her last film. Yeah. You think if it had been a hit, it might have been, she might have gone a little longer? Uh, more tempted. More people would have insisted, really. Yeah. But as it was, they didn't insist, so she went. And she always intended to return. And I was, the first time I met her was around 48, and she was pr already planning to go back. Walter Wanger was making a production at RKO of the Duchesse de Langeais, and she had gone as far as a wardrobe test no, it was just a straight test. I have a copy of it here. Somebody found for me. A what she, test? A test. She came uh, in, the and uh, they came in really to see how she looked. <laughs> so she comes on, and there's no sound. They she, couldn't recall she, how she looked? Well, no, five years had passed since ah, okay. Two-Faced Woman. They wanted to see what, what time had done to her. Which of the faces was left? Well, she looked wonderful. And um, she sort of undoes her hair, shakes her head, and she smiles. She looks tragic, and she goes off. Then they got as far as making the picture, and the studio was bought by Howard Hughes, one of the great SOBs of all time, and he canceled it. Oh. And Garbo, who was all ready to go back to work, was so humiliated by this that she never would put herself in a position again to be, in effect, rejected. So she never worked again. She was also wonderfully lazy. I mean, she was very happy with her life. She didn't want to get up that early anymore. Okay. Uh, was it... Uh, spooky in any way to be around her? Was she mysterious, strange? Was no. she fun? Was she um, smart? No, yeah, she was very bright. Yeah. Sense of humor. Very funny. And she had... Um, the only spooky thing was that as you watched her, she had about six poses. And she'd do all six for you. And of course, if you've been brought up on her movies, you kept going out of time, finding yourself suddenly in the midst of... Uh, conquest or Camille, you'd, she would be doing something that she had done on the screen, which you had seen 20 years earlier, and you'd look, where am I? You know, uh -huh. Am I in the movie or not? And she, and she knew she had this effect, too. She Sorry, was rather maybe. mischievous about it. Um, there's that remark Kenneth Tynan made in a famous piece about her, that what one sees in other women drunk, one sees in Garbo sober. Well, it was certainly true that she was about 65 when I knew her. Well, I, for about five years I went to Closters every year, and so did she. And we would take long walks together. So I got to know her quite well. And she was spectacular. I don't think she'd had a facelift or anything. Very little makeup. 
And her life really was looking for that perfect pullover, as she called it, sweater. It was just so you know, she spent 40 years looking for the perfect pullover. I think she mm -hmm. ended up with about 3,000 sweaters, which she had acquired looking for the perfect one, which she never did. You know about Groucho meeting her? No. In the MGM elevator? He was in a very small and rather crowded elevator and realized that the person standing in front of him had a slouch hat on, a uh, lady standing in front of him, and he pushed the back of the hat up so it came down over her face. She turned around furious. It was Garbo, and he said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were a fellow I knew from Kansas City. Um, that, <laughs> that was, was probably the day that she, t she told me about when she never wore hats. She had to wear <laughs> a hat because the Crown Prince of Sweden had come to the studio and L.B. Mayer was giving him a lunch in the commissary and Greta Garbo, as their biggest star and as their only Swede, mm -hmm. uh, was invited to sit next to the crown prince. So she wore a hat. She said, I remember this hat, this great thing falling off. And I sat next to him and he was very nice. And then she said, I just heard from him two weeks ago. Are we now speaking of 10, 15 years ago? He's king of Sweden and he's dying and he wants to see me. And I said, well, why? Oh, I think he says he was in love with me. And I said, you mean to say the dying king of Sweden and you won't go to see him? And she said, oh, so far. <sighs> and she said, I only saw him once. That's very Garbo-esque, mm -hmm. you know. And, and then she doesn't go. She made a perfect movie out of that, just one lunch yeah. with a floppy hat. Crown prince becomes king, is dying, and says that he was in love with her. Yeah. Would it have taken a real clod to say to her, do you ever realize what power you have if you do one benefit for AIDS, if you do one thing? Uh, somebody said about Mae West that the old bag never thought of anybody but herself in her life and never did anything for anybody. Um, maybe you can contradict that, you knew her. And, but Garbo could have um, done a lot of good, and I'm sure she got requests every day to come speak at PTA meetings. No, she uh, wouldn't have. Uh, she was only private life and only her own life, and those were her friends. And, and her work, she was very serious yeah. about herself as a personage. I was sufficient clod, the word you use. I was a real clod with her because I tried to get her here to Ravello, and it was here in the next house that she had her great affair in 37 with Leopold Stokowski. And she was driven away by the newsreel cameras and by the paparazzi. So I said, come to Rivello. And Garbo said, oh, no, the paparazzi is impossible. I said, you know, you, if you want to get rid of them, I can tell you how. She said, how? I said, hold a press conference. The entire press of the world will come. Garbo speaks. You can have a press conference. Say that you're going to do a mini-series for ABC <laughs> about a Swedish maid in a Middle Western household who solves all the family problems week after week after week. Mm -hmm said, so you'll get enormous. There'll be headlines all over the world. I said, then a month later, you call the press conference again. I said, fewer will come. Uh. Call a third one, nobody will come. <laughs> and she had a nice sense of humor, and she did not laugh. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. <laughs> I had thrown ink oh, for the that, Mona Lisa. It was a splendid idea. I don't know why she didn't do it. Were there any kind of uh, rules, if you would advise someone, if you're going to meet Garbo, and it's a little late now, uh, well, the main uh, rule was the no-nos in conversation with Garbo? No, that was the main one, was that she was not supposed to talk about her movies to her. Mm. But with me, she did nothing but talk about MGM. On our walk, she remembered the names of everybody she worked with, the second cameraman, her problems with L.B. Mayer, the making of her, she was meticulous about the making of every picture. And she was fascinated by it. She did nothing but read fan magazines and uh, silver screens. She was its most devoted reader. She liked Hollywood squares. Oh, I'm sure she would. Mm -hmm. you know. and she liked also European uh, film magazines. No, she was a real movie fan. Uh, betraying another confidence by the advantage of being in your own home here. I, I noticed among your uh, cassettes, uh, a young comic named W.C. Fields appears several times in your collection. So, uh, do, do you take uh, out the bank dick, uh, so to speak? And, As it uh, were. Uh, and <laughs> have a... I wish I'd thought of I think the name of, of a different uh, film. And uh, have a laugh now and then. Well, I love Fields. And, uh, yeah, I do. Uh, I like particularly those ones with a long day. You can't give a sucker. Uh, you can't... Never give a sucker. An even break, yeah. You can't cheat an honest man. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, very big about you, dear, he said to the waitress whose great bottom was facing him. <laughs> very big about you, too, Mr. Fields. She said, your nose. No, he was, he's always a joy. Not, there was a great purity about him. He hated yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. 
the people just thought he hated children. He hated also their parents as well. I mean, he was, <laughs> he was quite pure. You could have met Fields uh, chronologically and all, couldn't you? I could, and I yeah. uh, have a wonderful story of him and Nancy Walker, which I cannot tell. Oh. Uh, but it is funny. They were in vaudeville together. Tell it anyway. We'll cut it out and then play it later. <laughs> well, you are you can blip it. He, yeah. uh, she was on she was part of a sister act and they were on vaudeville and fields liked when they came to a town he liked to play golf he liked to play golf alone and he hated being touched these are two things so fields is they're out in cincinnati he goes to the golf club and she takes her along this little girl doesn't mind her because she knows how to keep quiet so the club boar comes over and throws his arms around fields and goes mm -hmm. like that club boar says, let's play a few uh, holes together, Mr. Fields. He said, if I want to play with a prick, I'll play with my own. <laughs> <laughs> but that was wasted tape, I feel. Oh, I don't know, you know. <laughs> things are loosening up all over. Uh, uh, can we look forward to the fact that your historical novels have now moved up very parlously close to the present? Uh, we haven't seen the last one, I hope. Well, I don't know. I think we may have seen the last one with... Hollywood, which is the next to last mm -hmm. in the chronology of them. Burr is the Revolution, Lincoln, 1876, Empire, Hollywood, Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. brings us up to almost the edge of Jack Kennedy. I have considered maybe doing this, somebody writing a biography of me, and I'm waiting really for that to come out. But I could do a reflection on the biography about me, which he would won. be a way of looking back at my own life which yeah. does not interest me all that much. But then I can look back over the political life of my town, then I'll extend it and look back over my fictional characters and try and encompass uh, the whole United States, which was my intention when I began, because yeah. it's only 200 years history. Yeah. So that's a possibility. Uh, Gore Vidal, thank you very much. That's how I saw a British talk show end with you once. Thank you.